production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High. Meet some of the misfit characters of a fictional town called Charlottesville. Everyone in Charlottesville is loved. No one gets turned away. No one gets made fun of. Watch me take a stab at figure drawing and murals that will leave you doing a double take. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Manicky. Our first story tonight takes us to a fictional town called Charlottesville. There, every misfit is loved and no one is turned away. It's the creative imagining and emotional journey of Charlotte McGraw, an artist at the Goodwill Columbus Art Studio and Gallery in Grandview. Cody used to always try to get me in the art room. And I told Cody, I said, look, I don't do art. He said, Charlotte, you don't know unless you come in and try. And I told him, nope, I don't do art. So he kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. So I said, oh, God, let me go in here and keep him quiet. Well, Charlottesville is a little town where my creatures can come, and um, they're not looked at like they have a disease. They're looked at like they're human. And everyone in Charlottesville is loved. No one gets turned away. No one gets made fun of. We in Charlottesville love each other. And I happen to be the mayor. When she first started working with this, and we had that backdrop, it was one of the first creatures she did. It just sang. It was. It just. It was just wonderful. It had so much character, and it really conveyed a lot of who Charlotte is as a person, and and um, her idea of what what life should look like. My creatures sometimes go through the same things I've been through, so. I understand how they feel. They come to Charlottesville, they're, they're, they're given a job, and they're an integral part of the community. They're accepted, they're seen, they're loved. Generally, I do collaging, um, painting, um, some drawing. I mean, a lot of her images have, there's a certain sweetness about them, but some of them are a little bit, a little intimidating. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Because they look at my art and they're like, where does your mind go? You know, and I said, I have my own little world, you know. And they say, what makes you do creatures? I said, because I love it. I said, uh, they're my own people. I was in an institution and I went there when I was 16 years old, and I didn't get out till I was about 27, 28 years old. And it's for people that have uh, physical and mental disabilities. But uh, it was a rough go. Um, you just never know what you're gonna see when you go into these places. Um, and a lot of people don't need to be there. Um, I think what it is, people get put in these places because no one wants to take the time. It's not necessarily that there's something wrong with them. It's just that they need someone to guide them. And when I went in there at 16, 
I was just a hot-headed teenager. And um, I didn't want to listen to anyone. Um, but I was labeled. I had problems at home, so I really didn't have anyone that I could go talk to. Um, missing a lot of love from home. Um, it makes you do things that you normally wouldn't do because you don't have that stabilization at home. I worked my way out. Um, I showed them that I could succeed in society and that I was not uh, incapable of taking care of myself. Right now, I'm doing a seri series, and it's called Popo. And I don't know if a lot of people know what Popo is, but it's the police. <laughs> I do creatures uh, that are coming to jail. It's called Charlotte's Correctional Fitness Center. Once they leave my jail, they have lost a lot of weight. And they go tell their friends, if you want to lose weight, you know, go to Charlotte's Fitness Center. You'll lose some weight going there. So it's basically, you come to my jail, I'm going to work you. And you're not going to get a lot to eat. <laughs> If it wasn't for and Debbie and Kate and Cody, this wouldn't be happening. So I appreciate all of them. Everybody that's in here, and like I said before, the family. You know, we all look out for each other. So it makes it worthwhile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do booby scarves, and it has some creatures on it, some medium boobies, <laughs> some big boobies, <laughs> some sagging boobies. <laughs> I heard someone back there just cracking up laughing, and Cody said, Charlotte. This lady just came in here and bought one of your booby scarves. <laughs> so he said, she's going back to work and tell everybody that they need to come and check out one of your booby scarves. <laughs> yeah, these are one of my booby scarves. <laughs> I love that it says smile. Yeah. <laughs> Now you're on booby camera. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Charlotte. You're Thank you. welcome. You can see Charlotte's work in person by visiting the Goodwill Art Studio and Gallery on Edge Hill Road in Grandview. The gallery is open to the public Tuesdays through Thursdays or by appointment. You can also follow them on Facebook. I recently got a chance to try my hand at figure drawing at the Rife Gallery. Mary Jane Ward was a patient instructor, and while I have a really long way to go, she helped give me some basic tips on how best to even start. So I have my handy tools, I have my sharp pencil that I learned you hold kind of loosely like this. I wanted to go in like I'm filling out a scantron, that's not the way to do it. You gotta loosely go like that. Generally, in an early stage of your drawing, uh, it's good to hold your pencil not like you're writing with oh. it, but in your hand like this, okay. so that you can use your whole arm okay. to draw instead of first. getting 
sucked into small details. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm like terrified to put a mark on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Just go for it. You can always erase. Okay. <laughs> Overall, um, I would reinforce straight lines as you're sketching in the early stages because okay. they're kind of easier to see what's wrong than a curve. So okay. if you can use your pencil, hold it out, uh, okay. keep your arm straight whenever you're measuring or comparing angles, okay. um, and stand exactly where you're standing for your drawing. Okay. So then you can compare here to here. And really, your angle looks pretty good. I'm seeing this yeah. looks great. She looks one-legged, I'll have to fix that. You're getting a good sense of the torso and even the leg bending underneath mm -hmm. the other one. Yeah, it's a tricky pose because it yeah. gets foreshortened from both ends. It's, it's complicated, but it's also kind of soothing. There's an interesting sort of zen feeling to it. Because it's a reclining pose, we want to feel like she's on the ground. We want to mm -hmm. feel a sense of connection with what she's resting on okay. so that we start to feel like she's on something flat. Okay. And then it starts to make more sense, the positioning of the body. Yeah. I like that my sketch looks like a person. You can tell I'm trying to draw a reclining human being. Um, so definitely I'm pleased with that. I'm nervous about details, about uh, making the face have an expression <laughs> that isn't a stick figure face, so I'm a little nervous about that. But yeah, I like that I feel like I've gotten the rough shape. I wish I could stop here and call it abstract, but we gotta keep going. Generally, I feel like this is more like an idea of what we think a head looks like. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like if you were to draw an eye and you, you know, you're thinking it, it just almond. looks like yeah. this. But um, especially from this perspective, it's gonna look totally different. So um, just starting with the geometric shape will help kind of get rid of that first assumption of yes. what the head is supposed to look like. So was this your first My drawing very, class? very first drawing class. I'm very impressed. Really? Yes. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is an awesome start. The figure is really hard to start with because as you found out, there's a lot of elements to negotiate. I think that you would feel very encouraged if you had a simpler subject. Figure drawing is not easy. I didn't expect it to be, but it was definitely challenging. Um, it's helpful to have someone really talented walking you through it. That is definitely a bonus. But what I think is great about it is it's something you can do at home. You can do on your own. You don't need a lot of equipment. And you can just kind of start doing it. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get. I learned that just even here in the two hours I took the class. I felt like I got a little bit better. So my drawing looked like a person. That made me happy. And it was a lot of fun. My mom better put this on her fridge because it's amazing. <laughs>If you're interested in expanding your skills at figure drawing, consider a session hosted on most Sundays by the Ohio Art League at X Space in Franklinton. Visit oal.org for details. The history of murals dates pretty much back to cave paintings, and they have dramatic impact on the folks who move past them every day. They can promote a political message, a social cause, or simply beautify a neighborhood. Many murals challenge us to think about an ordinary wall very differently, and good ones sometimes even have us doing a double take. My art is unique because it comes from me. It's a personal endeavor. It's a personal way to self-express. It speaks a language that kind of overrides any social, economic, racial, educational barrier. Uh, enables you to integrate your mind, your body, and your spirit together in one activity. I'm Suzanne Elizabeth Sellers and I'm an artist. I became interested in art from an early age. I grew up in the southeast part of Houston in a large Italian Catholic family. I can't ever remember a time when I wasn't creating something, whether it was painting, drawing, and that's just who I was, it's who I was then, it's who I am today. My own personal work, I work in acrylics, and when I do public murals, I work on large scale, uh, either using paint or tile work. A muralist is someone who, um, 
paints on a wall. And that wall can be small, it can be interior, it can be exterior, it can be in the form of contemporary or realistic, uh, whatever you choose it to be. When I did the Chase Bank mural, it was a six month project from meeting with their, uh, their team of people. From start to finish, it took me six months. That was a parking lot, and they were going to make that into a, kind of a park setting. They thought a mural would be a very good idea there. And we decided the best thing to go in that particular area was maybe a reflection of the history of Houston. It was just a fantastic and exciting and just very, very challenging opportunity. It was wonderful. Some of my murals are uh, in a style called trompe l'oeil, which is a French term meaning trick the eye. Basically, it's a matter of just creating an illusion of uh, windows and doors and architectural facades. You really have to learn to work with just lights and darks, because that's all it is. It's just an illusion, trying to trick someone into seeing what is not really there. The tile mural I completed for the, uh, it was the Houston Fire Department. They wanted that to be tile but it was about 60 feet by 16 foot tall, so that was a lot of tiles. And uh, it took more organizational skills than I thought I ever encompassed. Found some photos that represented that particular Denver Harbor community, worked with the fire department, and just tried to collage a series of images that represented the neighborhood as well as what the fire department did. And then it was just a process of firing about 4,000 tiles and uh, getting them up there on that wall. It is a challenge, uh, artistically and just physically, to complete something on that scale. When you do a mural such as the ones I completed for the Children's Assessment Center, you have to realize that you have an entirely different audience. And you have mostly children, you have mostly uh, parents who are maybe in distress or it's not a great place for them to be. And my murals are more whimsical, more colorful, uh, more images that they can relate to and make them feel comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. When I'm doing a, a small scale work, what I do is I go out and I just search for maybe an inspiration. I may put it on the computer and uh, edit it and just find the perfect way that I want to see it. Then I come to the canvas and begin to draw it out, uh, usually with charcoal, and kind of loosely block it in maybe with color. And that's when I start to fragment it. And then it slowly begins to focus and to take shape. My environment inspires my designs. I just look at everything that I see the way the sunlight hits the trunk of a tree, or if I'm going downtown, I love the way the light may play against the buildings, or I say on a construction worker's helmet. Every artist brings something unique to their own artist because they take from their own experiences, their travels, their location, their history. As an artist, I've evolved into becoming more willing to take risk. I'm bolder, I'm brighter, I'm more confident and I think that shows in my work. Be sure to check out the temporary mural series in the Short North Arts District. Visit shortnorth.org where you can download a map that lists the 19 murals that line High Street. Clara Barton is best known as the founder of the American Red Cross, but before that she established the Missing Soldiers Office in Washington, D.C., where she worked to help locate tens of thousands of soldiers who went missing after the Civil War. Since the 1990s, efforts have been underway to save and restore this historic building, along with some creative fundraising efforts. During the Civil War, Clara Barton became known as the Angel of the Battlefield. Not only was she a nurse, educator, and humanitarian, she was also a feminist long before it was fashionable. Clara Barton is one of the most famous American women uh, around the world. She's known for founding the American Red Cross. 
at a time when women were not allowed to do things, at a time when society said that women shouldn't do things, Clara Barton said no. She lived here all through the war, so this is the place where she collected medical supplies to go to places like Antietam. The space that we're sitting in today was actually called the Missing Soldier's Office. People would write to her asking, do you know what happened to my relative, my son, my brother, my, my husband? Um, and she would actually respond with her staff to over 60 thousand pieces of correspondence through this office to help identify the uh, whereabouts of over 21,000 men. This building was in such bad shape and there was really no history uh, associated with it uh, that they sent in a carpenter to look around and make sure it was safe to tear down. And when he was literally right behind me uh, in the next room over, he, he kind of felt something. He felt maybe a tap on the shoulder, or he, he finds it hard to describe even today. And it caused him to look at the ceiling. And there was a letter hanging from a piece of broken plaster. He pulled it down and saw that this address was on the letter. So he used a ladder, he crawled up in the attic, and what he found were signs saying, missing soldier's office, Miss Clara Barton, room nine, third floor. And he realized that this was Clara Barton's original Civil War office space. He went back to the GSA with that information, and then they started an effort that's really been in place since 1997 to preserve this place. The Clara Barton sessions were actually the idea, idea of a gentleman named uh, Johnny Grave. And Johnny came to us and, and heard the acoustics in this room and was kind of taken by the, by the sound, but also by the history of the place. I love the untold stories of Washington, D.C. I love the things that are hidden just beyond the door or just under a very fine layer of dust. I love those stories because that's what gives this city scope. That's what gives this city depth of character. Johnny decided to enlist the help of fellow musicians to raise money to fully restore the building that served as both home and office to this extraordinary woman. My idea was to bring Washington, D.C. performers from a wide variety of genres and bring them into the space and have them play. I wanted it to be something that will carry the memory of the space and the memory of that time into the, into the 21st century. So I asked my friends to pick a song from the Civil War, Claire Barton's era, and to also write a song about that time period or write a song about a person during that time period. The Clara Barton sessions were recorded in the museum in a single night. The music will be released as an album and also performed live to benefit the museum. Just a fabulous coming together of musicians in a museum and a community um, to, to bring about a sound that has never been heard before. Uh, a sound that was inspired by and, and literally shaped by a historic space, but then was inspired by her legacy and a modern tradition right here in, in Washington. We were impressed and enamored with the way that our instruments, that our songs sounded in this room. The songs that we handpicked from the Civil War and the songs that we all wrote together were bouncing off the very walls that Clara Barton worked in. Everyone brought an amazing amount of energy into the space that night. Everyone had a story to tell. Everyone had a song to play. It was a truly beautiful experience. I hope people can take these songs and, care, and take them with them wherever they go. Um, learn them, share them, tell those stories. By doing that, Clara Barton's work, her memory, the memory of this space, and all of the correspondence that came through this space, in a way, lives forever.
We want to make this a place where music and art and photography and history and public conversation about modern topics that have a historical base all come together. Proceeds from the album and live performances of the Clara Barton sessions will be used to fully restore this historic space. When a visitor comes here, I hope they take her example and that they go back into their own communities and, and begin to volunteer and begin to say, I want to carry on the legacy of Clara Barton by making my world a better place. It doesn't matter who you are. You can change the world too. That's our show. You can watch all of today's stories at WOSU.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing the show with the sounds of the Columbus-based Americana band known as the Boondogglers. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join us back here next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.